Ask not what Almighty God can do for you. Ask God what you can do for your country. Now the trumpet summons us again, where the strong are summoned to give service, summoned to bear arms. All this will be finished, the final success of Syria, asking his blessing, and let us never fear the command to undo the heavy burden and let the oppressed go free. Let us begin. I want to bring up Eddie Penny. I'm going to intro him because some of you don't know Eddie. I'm going to bring up um, Pastor Mike Johnson, Steve Prouse, and, and I'll be up here too. And we'll just open it up to a, a Q&A for a good chunk of time. Does that sound good? All right. So I don't know where Eddie is, but let me tell you a little bit about Eddie Penny. Steve Prouse, who I'm going to bring up as well, sent me a podcast, a five-hour podcast. I believe the host name is Sean Ryan. Phenomenal podcast all about, you know, they're, they're battle guys talking about war stuff. And I, I'm, I'm really taken by Eddie because there's, he doesn't know this, I just met him a little while ago. There's a softness about him, but yet I'm hearing about how many bad guys he's taken out. And he's a bad dude. And I'm like, what is it about this guy, Eddie Penny? I think it was like three hours and change in, he drops the Jesus word in. And I'm like, oh, now I get it. God's working on his heart. So after the podcast, I watched all five hours. I found the website. I reached out, sent an email, and my thought was, a lot of people want to get a hold of Eddie. I'm going to probably get the proverbial, you know, busy thank you. And I don't quite understand how we hooked up, but he called me, and I gave him like three minutes of what we do, and he said, I'm there. He's author of the book, Unafraid. Eddie, come on up here. Eddie Penny. Hello. So Stephen Prouts, um, crazy God story. Uh, I was watching videos on Instagram one night and I see this dude walking the street in the middle of the night, black hat, kind of dark. I'm like, this dude's kind of menacing. And he's just spitting fire about the word, challenging, and it's the fifth horseman. So I started following him. This is the way I remember the story. Maybe Stephen's got a little different version. And so I think I hit him up, said, here's my number, call me. I get a phone call from him, and I didn't put two and two together at first, and then I realized this is the dude that I started following. So literally in the last few months, God's really accelerated him and I shoulder to shoulder where I feel like, like he's my brother from another mother and we've walked these grounds a few times and he's entrenched in KMG now and does a lot for us. And uh, if you are on Instagram, there are some good things. You need to follow Fifth Horseman. I think it's fifth.horse. And he's also fourth watch. Stephen Prouse, welcome him. And Pastor Mike, you know, but this is something I need to say. Um, in a zillion years, the last thing I would have thought would, uh, I would lead a men's ministry, let alone a Christian men's ministry. I got the daddy wound and all that junk that we, you know, I love the mad analogy, I can get down there right now. But about three or four years ago, I knew Mike, I had him on my show, he shared his testimony, and, and I just really resonated with him. We have sports in common, although he's a Bengals fan, I'm a former Browns fan, they can kiss my ass as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> bringing on a quarterback with his, uh, boy, I just don't talk like a Christian, do I? It's like shocking. Oh, believe me, God will, God will rebuke me if indeed I'm really out of line. But anyway, so Mike and I got to talking one day, and then he told me a story about a player that he recruited. I won't go too deep into the story. We went and visited him. It's pretty wild. And then on the way back, I had been praying about, I can't do KMG by myself. I was working full time at that time. And somehow it just kind of came out. Mike had been praying about doing something with men and men's ministry. And by the power of God, I, I pray we are stuck together for many more years to come. I could not do this without him. He is the original, in my mind, the original KMG guy. We want Pastor Mike Johnson up here too.
All right, so here's the format. What time we got here? 11.20. We're going to go to about noon, maybe a little after. Um, what I would like to get into a little bit of the many things maybe you want to bring up, I want to talk about spiritual warfare. Church doesn't teach it. Even if you profess to be a Christian, a lot of you don't understand spiritual warfare, how you can battle, because we think, well, no, it's, the, it's in the spiritual realm, and, and God takes that fight up, and we think somehow that means we got no fight in it, which is a load of you-know-what. So I want to talk about spiritual warfare a little bit. So let me ask a question or two, and then if you have a question, I'll run out with a mic, or we'll figure out how to do this. So let me just start with Stephen, and we'll work down. Um, him and I have talked a lot about spiritual warfare. Anything on your heart you want to share to start, either about that, just give us a few minutes, and I'll go to Eddie and Mike, and then we'll go to the Q&A. I need to remind every person that's here in the room and watching that there's no prayer in heaven. There's none. You're going to check out. Right? We're all spiritual beings, surrounded by spiritual beings, us in the room serving a spiritual God, going to a spiritual place. Most people have no idea what the kingdom of heaven and that spiritual presence will feel like because you're not feeling it on earth as it is in heaven, even though we're told to pray that down. It's our words, the vocal, vocal expression of our faith, of our belief, of scripture, of praying God's word back to him and his word not returning void. But, you know, last time I checked, none of us are getting out of here alive. Which means the moment that you die, you're judged. God sends you where he sends you. If you're up in the nosebleeds in heaven, you don't have a dog in this fight. You can't somehow see how powerful Christ died to make you and then say, oh wait, I have something to say now. I have something to speak, I have something to pray now. You're done. And then according to Ecclesiastes 3.15, what has been is the past, what will be is the past, and the Lord requires an account of it all. What does that mean? He's gonna sit next to you looking at the highlight reel of your life at all the moments that you could have chosen to take a spiritual stance in prayer, to exercise faith in the moment, to speak authority and life, even to speak death as Jesus cursed the fig tree. Everyone's playing it too safe no matter who you are, myself included. There are levels that we have yet to reach and we're playing it safe. But I'm reminding you, there's no prayer in heaven, which means you better be poured out here if you think that you're gonna honor God. Psalm 115, the dead, dead don't praise the Lord, nor do any who go down in silence. And every single man in this room is feeling something. There's an agitation, there's an anger, there's a frustration about the human condition, the political condition, the cultural condition. First in prayer and then in person. If God can't even trust you enough to pray his word back at him and pray it out loud, how is he going to trust you to do something in person? That's for you. So in our last segment, Stephen's going to lead off, then Annie, then Daryl. And I don't necessarily want to get Eddie a mic um, and have him share his testimony. He'll have plenty of time for that. So, first of all, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. I, and I, and I, you, you just called me soft before I walked up here, which I'm like, dude, what? What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Had to call you out on that one. No, it's good to be here, man. <laughs> guys, seriously, I'm so glad you guys are here right now. It's, it's freaking awesome. In the spiritual warfare thing, that's actually what I was going to focus on, because uh, that's, that's what's destroying a lot of us, myself included. Um, we hear the word, the word spiritual warfare, and we're like, oh yeah, Ephesians 6, you know, put on the armor of God and all that good stuff because it's cool t-shirts and it's tagline. We don't understand the reality, and I was the same way before anything. When I was like looking at my life, I'm like, why does this keep happening? Why do I keep watching porn and I don't want to watch porn? Where did that voice come from that said, stop what you're doing and go watch porn? Or like, hey, now's a good time to go drinking. Like, dude, I was about to go work out. Where did that voice come from? And we don't understand that the, we, we, we claim it is, you know, the enemy. We got the world, we have the flesh, 
And then we have the enemy, Satan, right? We hear the word Satan and devil, and we don't understand that Satan cannot be everywhere at all times. He is a created being. Right now, alarms are going off in your head, Eddie, you sound weird, and that's good, because I don't want to be the normal. I don't want to be the normal. I will not be the normal. I've done normal. And I was falling and I was failing and I kept getting taken out over and over and over again. Why? You got to look at it this way. It was taught to me this way. If we go, if we go fishing, I have some lures and I just throw out a lure and I got a red lure. Throw it out there. No fish, no fish are biting. I put on my blue lure, throw it out there. Boom. I'm biting. I'm biting. The fish are biting. That is the enemy. I'm the fish. They're going to throw something out there that you bite on and they're going to keep using it until you destroy it. We destroy these strongholds, these agreements, humble ourselves, submit, resist. Until we understand that, that we need Christ and we're not going to do anything without Christ because through Christ we get to the Father and we take out the enemy. That's real spiritual warfare. It's not, I got this, I've tried it for years. And I found myself in the same place, quit drinking, quit porn. Found myself back to it only when I humbled myself. I'm like, God, I need you. I can't do this on my own, man. We're not supposed to. We, you just talked about your sons. If they came to you and needed your help, what would you do? You would help them. We would all help our sons, our daughters. That's our father. We have got to look at him as this like mythical, I'm in the clouds, not up in your business character. And that's what the church kind of talks about, this soft, well, we don't, we don't want to offend anyone. We want to, we want to bring him to Christ. But you pretty much send him on the battlefield without a gun and here's a lollipop. And you're getting taken out by Satan, the enemy. All right. So there's, there's multiple facets that kind of go into this, what I'll, I'll probably dive into now that I'm totally like amped up, um, is that... You've got to look at this as a, a mob organization or a, a terrorist network in the flesh. All right, we used bin Laden before he got taken out. <laughs> All right, and then he's got his little cronies underneath him. He's got his generals, his captains, and then he's got the low levels that run their things. What I'm about to say is going to be weird. You'll be like, that's nuts. This is all biblical. This isn't any just making up stuff. All right, and I've, I've dealt with this, this um, personally, so I'm not making this up. Because you have to understand, you've got the enemy assigned to you, especially men of the household. Why, why are men of household targeted so much? It's because you have a freaking crosshairs on your freaking uh, forehead. If I take you out, I've got a generation of kids that don't have a father and they don't know what to do and they're going to do it again. Now our spouse, they don't have the support that we have. We are taken out. And we've got to understand that and we've got to rise. Spiritual warfare is not a phrase. It is a put on my armor and go fight the freaking enemy and we engage. The defensive posture must stop. We go attack. How do we do that? We ask Christ. We submit. We obey. He tells us what to do and we fight. All right, I got carried away. <laughs> I didn't set the chairs up, Stephen, Eddie, you. I didn't set up where you're the last, at least, so good luck on following those two. <laughs> I could ask you a question, but I, I just get a sense, like, anything else that you want to share, convey on your heart as we kind of transition into the Q&A? Um, <clears throat> do you think you and I used to be able to beat these guys up? <laughs> I'm looking at the size of these guys. I'm like, holy cow. Who doesn't belong up here? Um, no, I, I, I love this conversation. I've jumped down some really big rabbit holes. I'm not going to jump down them today. Spiritual warfare to me has moved to warfare. Like Satan's not even hiding himself anymore. Um, I, when, I, when I was pastoring a, a, at a church, I actually had two different, I had three different churches I oversaw. One was in Agua Dulce, out in the beautiful area there was snow and everybody was lovely i had one in woodland hills and i used to say that satan dressed up as business people there and then i had a campus in um down here at the at the va in in west la and i used to say uh satan disguises himself in um a lot of different ways and a lot of illnesses 
and a lot of, uh, you know, I dealt with veterans a lot and um, red zone veterans, guys that had seen action and really, and, um, you know, I, I, was, I was very, I was, I hurt for them so badly because of what they were carrying with them. But I could also see that Satan did not want them to come into the church. He would let them walk around the church and they would meet with me outside of the church. And I actually took a class on how to engage veterans because I, I, I didn't fight. I, I don't have that in my background, but I didn't want to be disrespectful and everything. And you would ask, I would ask, where did you serve? Where were you hit? Um, now, I'm fully expecting Satan to walk in the door because when you watch TV now, they don't even pretend. So, so for any of you who don't understand spiritual warfare or have never paid attention to it, let's just say that, I would say today's a good day to start paying attention. Because as Eddie said, they already have a cross on you coming for you. It was a little bit what I was talking about earlier. Like, this is no joke anymore. It shouldn't have been before, and that's why the American church is where it is and the way it is right now, right? But we need to equip men to fight this, this battle. And when I can't even watch TV now without everything's about Satan. It's sad, and it's right here. Like, what Matthew Barnett's doing at this church is amazing, considering what's going on just outside of his doors. And so this is a battle we need to be ready to fight. We need to be scripturally ready. We need to totally be into the fight because as soon as you're not, you're gonna get winged, you're gonna be out. And God wants to destroy your family more than anything that he can. And he doesn't want you three guys to even get a start. He doesn't want my oldest who's a pastor. I tell him all the time, he's 25, 24, I should know. Um, and he's a pastor and I tell him all the time, you're not an athletic director. You're not a physical therapist like your mom. This is a battle that you chose. I wish you wouldn't have, but I'm proud that you did, but you don't get to play like everyone else does when you go to work because they're coming for you. And so I, I just hope that this segment, if this is where I think it's going, you're able to really capture something with this, that you're able to ask questions that maybe you haven't been able to process before. I'm not sure that we'll all have the answers, but um, I think it's an important topic. So that being said, yeah, go ahead and applaud. <laughs> Questions? Any question in particular? Brother over here, let me get you the mic. And if you can ask a question, be brief. Time is of the essence. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Um, the question that I have that I'm in a, a spiritual warfare, um, I haven't read my Bible in about a month and a half, and um, it's been kind of bothering me, but the question I have with myself is when I read my Bible, and or I started to read my Bible, I realized that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and then um, he wasn't born yet. So I'm like under trying to understand in this poetic or prophecy or prophesize that I'm in a spiritual warfare where the enemy comes in and tries to steal my mind when I read the Bible and then I try to say well how did Moses write that when he wasn't even born and then I try to go into the New Testament and then I know Jesus came to fulfill all those laws but I just wanted to know how do I go about trusting what I read in the first five books. So I have a brief answer, and then if anybody else wants to jump in. Uh, I don't profess to know the answer of answers, but I'll share my struggle with the Bible, and then I had a little epiphany. I can relate to that. Sometimes I read the Bible. If you read the Bible in a year, you know, you power through, hey, I read the Bible in a year, you don't remember anything, or have no retention level. So I tend to read the Bible slow, but there are times where I don't understand anything I'm reading. 
And then I get this thought in my head, well, yeah, wait a minute here, there's this contradiction. And who are the Nephilim and the whole nine yards? But here's what I just want to tell you for me. I don't go there. I read it as this is the active living word of God and just take and ask God to speak to you as you read it. The other stuff I have no answer for. I'm not a Bible scholar, but I know we could probably spend the next 50 years going in and talking about, hey, what about this seeming contradiction? And what about that? So I just want to share that with you. Get back in the Word if you can. Just read Psalms and Proverbs for a while. And just ask God to speak through you, through His Word. Maybe somebody's got a much better answer than that. I'm going to jump in real quick. Uh, we have a very serious problem with bad theology in this country. And this is why. Moses didn't write the first five books. The Jews were so good at oral tradition. God in His wisdom chose a small, a small nation, a small tribe of people, and they were so good at just passing stories down and stories down. So you can't definitively say this man wrote it. Even if you did definitively do that, there's a voice saying, don't read it. You have to hate that voice. If what you're doing to manage the voice isn't working, people, everyone tries to manage sin. You can't manage sin. You have to hate it. You have to kill it. You have to take it out back and put two in the back of the head. Okay? There's no managing sin. There's surrendering to Christ. There's praying to God through Christ. Praying for deliverance, right? Faith. The building up of faith. The destroying of unbelief. If you read the word and there's unbelief, it's a little mixed feeling there, right? So, everyone has seasons of this. They read something. They need to process it. You need the Holy Spirit's revelation. You need God to be showing you and illuminating his word to you as you read it. But what does that take? Contrition. Surrender. It means like, you know, something your ways are higher. And the moment you think that you can attain understanding for the whole word of God, when the word of God, as Revelation says, it's being revealed to us. I pray to God I never arrive. And so far as I read the Bible, it's, it's, I'll read the same passage, the exact same one today that I read, that I even memorized 20, 30 years ago. It's completely different now. I will never arrive. I hope to God I will never arrive because I serve the God of adventure the God that's leading each and every one of us and calling us forward into exploits, into faith, destroying unbelief, strongholds, not just the ones, the complex systems of unbelief in our mind, but the ones that literally exist with principalities in the world. And so you have to hate that voice. You have to hate that you even have that voice that you've given an audience within yourself. Like there's a point of us where you realize we are evil. If we're outside of relationship with God, we're evil. The heart is desperately wicked, so there's a part of you that you even have to say like, no, you're dying today, and I'm going to go forward with Christ. All right, let's go back here. Uh, you had your hand up. Can you pass the mic down, please? What are some of the tactics that the enemy is using today? as he's trying to accomplish his purpose? That's a good question. And every tactic is different from every person in this room. Goes back to the lure. What's working for you? Is it alcohol? Is it porn? Is it women? Is it gambling? Is it your work? If they have a tactic that's constantly working for me, it was porn, it was womenizing, it was pills, it was drinking, it was pride, it was ego. There's a long list actually, I could keep going on this, but they were using whatever works. And when if, if you're buying into it every time, they can kind of focus their forces on someone else that's actually more engaged with, with Jesus. You have to look at it, you have got to look at what we see in the movies of combat or warfare in the flesh is the exact same thing that's happened in the spirit world. It is the exact same thing. You have an enemy that wants to kill you. They want to take you out. Once you are taking out, taking you out, they don't need, really need to worry about you. Might they need to send somebody that does something, drops a whisper, hear a voice, right? I heard a voice. You're going to hear a lot of voices. You guys know exactly. There should be like ringing going off like crap, crap. That's it. And we get to a point like, mm, I don't think so. In the name of Jesus, get back. But that's the thing. A lot of times in the name of Jesus does not work. Well, the Bible says that, you're right, but, but some of these you have given rights to. 
You have given them rights to harass. It says in the Bible that Satan is before God day and night accusing brothers and sisters, paraphrasing here, that's us. Why is he in front of God? Why is he accusing us? Because we give him right. Oh, they sinned. That's where sin comes from. We hear the word sin. I used to be like, ah, religion, eat, get out of here. But it's really like, hey guys, we need to be doing the right thing. That makes sense. We should be doing the right thing. Through our sin, and I'll get into more of this when I do my talk, they get the rights to access us and torment us and our family. That's why. That's why so many men have strongholds that they cannot break is because they did not, they have not humbled themselves, submit, and through that process, we need to confess, we need to repent, we need to forgive, and really we just need to listen to what the Spirit is giving us, hey, you need to do this. Once we do that, once we just ask and listen, oh buddy, the world changes. So yeah, long answer. And, and I'm not gonna expound on that, but I'll just say this. There are generational curses as well. 100%. Where you didn't do anything. We'll, we'll talk, we're going to talk about all those when I get up here. And even the vault answer is whack-a-mole. What's his attack? First deception, confusion, but it's whack-a-mole. It's whatever you have a blind side to. And he's testing everything against everyone all the time, even when you sleep. I think also on a macro level, it's the stuff we're seeing nationwide now, somewhat worldwide where whether it's the drag queens talking to our children in libraries, like what is that about? And when did that become okay? And who are the parents that are allowing this? Um, I think a lot with the whole LGBTQ movement, I don't know the rest of the letters. BF210. Thank you. Um, I think with the media, I think the enemy Satan is using the media now to just gaslight it all to it's all okay and then as a parent you're like your kids are coming home they're so confused and you're like no that's not okay and then they're mad at you um so awareness but again and i'm i'm, I'm leaving this church out of it because i believe in everything matthew's done i think the churches have let us down because they don't know theology i fully agree and i think they're scared to preach and that's why all this is happening and is happening on a grand scale because no one is standing up to it. You know what they also though? The audience wants sweet baby infant Ricky Bobby Jesus. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want strong Jesus, they want soft Jesus. They want, they want the faith that doesn't challenge you, doesn't push you, doesn't compel you, doesn't speak up. You just be a nice, good Christian when Jesus doesn't need you to be nice. He needs to be men of God, men of faith with dangerous faith. And so why are the men attacked so much, especially now? Because if the man is taken out of commission, you can't defend your own house, your family, your children. You can't defend the house of God or the faith. Thank you, sir. Our pastors uh, have been taken out. And uh, if you look at it from a military standpoint, we got generals, and captains out there who, they're not just out of the action, they're actually working counterintelligence. And uh, can we save them? We were warned about that, right? Yeah, and is, is it, do we just need to field commission some new guys? <laughs> what do we do? I'll just, my brief answer, there's a lot of pastors who shouldn't be in that chair. There's a lot of men who don't confront them or speak life to them and correct them, don't challenge them. Why? You don't read your Bible. You don't know your Bible. You're, 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 so many men are keeping a conversation here about drinking, a porn, masturbation, kids, right? The conversation has to elevate. You have to get distance from the enemy and take on a heavenly perspective and say, all right, God, this is the crap that I see. What do you want me to see? And so if, if men can't even rise above the muck and the noise, you can't challenge the pastors, you can't even speak life, you can't warn the others, you can't judge. We're all called to judge, by the way. Assess. Make an assessment. Not condemn, but judge. We're even going to judge the angels. But the bottom line answer is the church has been compromised. You keep looking at a four-wall church, you're going to miss it. Each one of you is called to be the church. The longer we hold on to the four-wall church model, it's never going to work.
I should have my phone so I can get my steps in here. How many steps did I do today? Let's go way in the back. What's up, brother? My brother. Y'all preaching, preaching. Uh, real good. Uh, question. Life happens. But how do you strategize and not making excuses? Uh, just to be godly, to be loving, to be a man of God, period. I'll say this. Um, some of you in here might have joined me. I taught a Nehemiah class online, a couple of them. I really think Nehemiah is an example there in the Bible, short, short, short book. But, you know, when's the last time you fasted, wept, cried, prayed about a situation? Um, you talk about, I think we have to develop consistency. One of these gentlemen mentioned training. Training is the same uh, with our relationship with God as it is with, with our bodies. Like, are you preparing yourself for what's next? Are you preparing yourself for what's next with your family? If you're not in it, you're getting ready to be in it. So you better be training. Um, and so, yes, life does happen. Life gets messy and it gets messy quick. And we have to be able to respond to that. But I always say this, as a man, one of our greatest honors as a father is to walk our family through something really hard. I had a, I had a friend of mine text me the other day and he lost his wife and he said he was asking for advice and i said i said what an honor to be a man and to be in your situation to walk your family through this i'm sorry you're going through this but we'll be praying for you i'm not sure that we all look at that that way i think at times we look for the easy way out men it's an honor to lead your family you are blessed even when you feel like you're not and so being scripturally in in shape having your prayer life in shape that you're ready for what's coming at you and i'm not saying you're not going to get knocked down but you just got to get right back up well let me say one quick thing um and then Stephen, and then we'll jump back here probably not answering your question but what i heard this is my answer and this has been a real struggle in my life i always have thought i'm supposed to be nice i'm supposed to be you know don't 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 escalate for me my answer to what you said is I got to get pissed. I got to get angry and get real about what Satan's trying to do before I can do all of those things that Pastor Mike shared and everything else that's part of the regiment. Men aren't getting mad anymore. We think we're just supposed to play nice. This is a war. And I think the Bible speaks clearly about righteous indignation. But for me, I got to get really angry. Well, I want to say this real quick. I'm going to be the pastor here for a second. I'm going to get fired. Not by me. I think we need to be in shape so that we can get angry the right way. There because you, you cannot sin in anger. There you go. So the only way that we can do that as men is if we've done all the, all the groundwork first that will give us the right to fight. Yep. The reason America is the, right, the way it is right now is because we're not ready to fight. Because just exactly what you're talking about, we're keeping the conversation here. We have got to get to that spot that we've earned it through prayer and scripture and service yeah. and all those other things that when they cross the line, they've crossed our line. Right now, too many of us are trying to fight from the outside and saying we're mad, but we haven't done any of this stuff. And Satan goes, done. Yep. That, sorry. No, well said. Uh, Stephen, let me jump back here. Are you can yeah. hold it. Please, uh, I have a question. He's been wanting to ask this. Go ahead. Is having bad dreams the beginning of spiritual warfare in someone's life? That's my question. Okay. No, it's just part of every day, depending on how deep you're in it. And this is why your subconscious can absolutely be attacked by things, right? You're asleep. There's no defense. There's no mental aware defense of things. And so uh, the kingdom of heaven never sleeps, right? Uh, so, just so everyone understands, the period of time between 12 and 3 a.m. is the highest level of witchcraft activity worldwide. 
And then 3 to 6 a.m. is the highest level of demonic or you could say spiritual activity. All throughout the Bible it says, and the Lord awoke from sleep and the Lord rose early. Even in Jeremiah, two places it says that God has his prophets waking up early. Why? The air is thin. It's very thin. Dreams are part of the program. I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't have wild dreams. I even have woken up and have had scratch marks on me that weren't there the day before. God allows us to get close. And even touching on what you said before, praise God. Every single time that we experience things, we get knocked down, God is handing us an opportunity to die to self and put on the mind of Christ. I think what a, lot, a lot of times what happens is that men are like, oh, you know something? Uh, I got offended. I got insulted. I can't believe they're doing this, this, that, the wife, the kids, right? The, the insults, the lack of respect. And what they do to Jesus? If, if you want to be Christ-like, cut the BS. See, you keep looking at yourself and your condition and the outcome of other people's response to you and your lack of spiritual engagement. To be honest, because if you were actually spiritually on that path and on that level in the word, in the fight, are you looking at yourself or are you looking at them? Right? And this is the, the tragedy of, of most of humanity. We look to people and say there's no God instead of looking to God and seeing people clearly. That's on us. It's not on him. We have time for maybe two more. Hey guys, throughout this, with all the information that has got, it's a lot, it's like I'm drinking from a fire hose, it's like, dude, I gotta do this, oh my gosh, what's going on? If you, if you follow down one principle is focus on Christ and deal with the darkness as it comes in, when I say focus on Christ is what does he say? Not what they say, my neighbor says, the media says, focus on Christ and you deal with it as it come in. That's it, focus on Christ. What does that mean? Talk to him. You mean have a conversation? Yes, I mean have a conversation with him and you will talk back. First, humble yourself and realize you need him. And you will be surprised how much of a tier one operator you become in the kingdom. Uh, two quick questions. How would you define a godly man? And two, how as a church do we engage the culture that's trying to destroy the fabric of the church? What was the first question? How do you define a godly man? Oh, okay. And two, how as a church do we engage the culture that's trying to destroy us? I'll, I'll touch on the second one real fast, which just jumped out to me, is uh, be the example. Don't talk about it. There's a lot of talk. There is so much talk. There's a, a media platform for everything, pictures, talk, videos. It's be the example. And it, I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. It's not. You will be looked at weird. You will think that you can't do certain things. But the, the, the fact is, again, held accountable to God only. And that is our purpose. You, we've got to understand this big picture. And this sucks. I'm totally doing my speech right now. It's like we've got to understand our place in the story. It is not, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to hang out with some people. I'm going to deal with the kids that are annoying me. I want to punch my boss on the face, but I can't because I'm weak. I haven't been in the gym in two months. Like we, there's a bigger story here. We have a father, we are sons. That's a thing called a family. He wants his family at the end once certain things are done. And if you're not obedient to dad, that means you're with someone else. That's it. I, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. That's it. So be the example. Enough of the talk, enough do this. No, no, you show, you show. You show them how to do it. Why, do, why don't you drink? Here's why. Why'd you, how'd you stop porn? Here's how. Well, that's weird. Cool. I don't want to be like you. I want to be who my father tells me I am. That's my identity. We've talked about this identity piece. God, these words keep coming up. This identity, these things. We try to find, I'm, and I was guilty of this too, and I still find myself going back sometimes. Is this post going to make me look cool? Anyone done that? Like, who can be honest with themselves right now? I've done that many times. I'm like, dude, wait a second. No, what does God say? Is this, is this going to glorify you, God? Because that's what I want in my life. Not this crap we see. I'm sorry. It's evil. This is Satan's world. But he has no authority over the ones who walk with God. All right? And don't, don't, as much as that question, the first question is a good one. What does the word of God say a godly man is? Not us. 
we might miss it. We might have one facet within the family where we're called to do this or that, right? There's a season of spiritual warfare. You're the zealot that's on fire, the new convert. You're the warrior monk that's isolated in the woods with the spirit. And then you're the president with the red phone ringing. And as soon as that red phone rings, you know it's God and he needs you to intercede and do something. Outside of that, you're a suffering servant. Revelation 1 calls you a king and a priest. You are exactly what he says that you are, but you have to walk in it. You can't bullshit it. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. We have some, we have an old, he's not here today. Uh, we have a guy that comes to all of our man camps. He literally looks like John the Baptist. His name's Eddie. He's just tall, walks with a cane. And he was, he felt like at his church, um, the pastor was not leading properly. But instead of running him out, doing all this crazy stuff, he literally committed to serving this man, but the whole time was praying for his removal. Not by him, but by God. Now, in our world, we want immediate results. It took three years. But by just being a godly man and a fighter, but also praying, God, if this is not the guy, you need to get him out of here because I don't think this is being led right. After three years, God removed him, and they've got another person in there now. I don't know how that's going, but I'm just saying, we talk about how, how are you praying? Are you praying to God for results? Are you, are you trusting in this situation? Uh, Eddie was a great example of that. All right. We've got time for one more question, and let me share this little bit of a disclaimer. If you got your hand up, put your hand down. There's a few of you that, you know, it's, it's really burning. You gotta ask this question. Hey, well, I'm not, I'm not over here. Ask yourself right now if the question you have to ask is really something you have to get into now. Because we only have time for one more. Some of you are gonna feel shut out, but I'm really strongly impressed right now. There is someone in the room that needs to ask a question. And in all honesty, he's not even got his hand up. So all that to be said, I'm gonna scan the room. If I don't call on you, don't be offended or be offended, get over it. <laughs> and we got time literally for one question and I pray it's succinct and short. Okay, I see a few of you. Actually, that's where I was gonna go. And I'm gonna go to you because I know you're just dying. In fact, let me go to him first and then I'll close with you. Go ahead. Good morning, guys. I just. Is it working? Yeah. So I just want to start saying that how much I appreciate you guys. That's my fourth uh, conference, and I've been in one retreat too. So uh, I grew up in church. I need a question. I'm going to make a question. As quick as possible, uh, not to be rude. The Lord impressed upon me not to call on you. And let me tell you why. Because your time is more valuable, and you have a lot to share, and the context is not now. And I know you've spoken before, and I really appreciate your heart, but we've got a really tough clock that we're working on now. So only if you can, try to ask your question, and then maybe I'll see if I can come back where you can share a bit of your story. Is that fair? Of course. Okay, thank you. Um, how are you guys going to help the LGBT community to be rescued and come to Jesus? It's a good did question. You say, did you say help? Is that what you said? Yes. That is something that Christ can handle. Amen. And one thing we are going back to the spiritual warfare is we got to understand that we've got certain spirits, spirits of divide, spirit it is. There is a homosexual spirit, plain and simple. And they use that community. The, the community, that doesn't mean that everyone's bad person. The sin is the sin. That's bad. The person is a child of Most High. That has got to be understood. There is nothing wrong. They are oppressed. Just like my porn, just like my drinking, or somebody got their face in a, a pile of white powder, it's the same thing. We've, we're getting oppressed and we're getting taken out. But that is a thing for Christ, working through that, digging deep, and the evil one is going to come in and be like, no, this is who you are. This is how you were made. You weren't. You weren't. I don't know if we're, uh, who we're talking about, but I'm just saying like that there is a homosexual spirit and it is rampant in this country right now. Plain and simple, end of story. That's real spiritual warfare. That is a battle and the men and women that are trapped in that, it's a fight. It is a fight because they really believe that. Well, I believe that I always had to have a drink. 
I believe that's who I was. I, I, I do porn all the time. That, I, that's what I believed. That's who I was. That was my identity. No, it's not. The Bible's very clear on this. I'm done. Um, how, do you, how do you get through um, the anger of being in combat and trying to accept the word of God? You asked that question and about to break into tears. That's been a tough one, man. You're, um, God, why'd we call on you? <laughs> no, that was, that was, that was clearly know, the guy no, the Lord was I know, it's like, that's, know. yeah. Um, combat's, combat's a funny thing, and it's not so funny. It's, uh, it's what we think it is until you're there, you're like, holy crap, this is really real. And I struggled, and... My family got torn apart, two of them actually, from my anger, and I needed to suppress. I went to drinking, went to porn, went to women, and it was very hard. I'm like, pretty much had to be waterboarded into like, hey, there's a, we got to find somebody that can do this, and it wasn't anything man-made. It's not psychedelics. It's not a shot in my neck. It's not go talk to a counselor. The counselor does help, don't get me wrong, but it is putting my, my life in Christ's hands and understanding just how strong and loving he is, is he is the most loving individual, God, that there is, but he is the fiercest warrior that we have ever seen in anything. He is all of it. And we're not, we're not talking about this like, oh God, it's in this book. We, we, we've got to grasp the reality of this. This stuff makes me mad. And why does it make me mad? And I'll get into my testimony a bit, is that I was taken out forever. I was a tier one, the best, the best. Into the flesh, I was the man. I was a baby boy to my father. I was a toddler drinking out of a bottle, milk. I was weak. But I needed Christ to come in and to mend my heart, to take care of my soul. <sighs> and to be loved because the world wasn't doing it. The drinking wasn't doing it. The women weren't doing it. My buddies next to me weren't doing it. They were just as screwed up as I was. I needed him. I still need him. He holds my family together. He holds me together. Once you realize that, and it is hard for us to see it because we have an enemy that will come in and just steal and steal and steal. We are on a battlefield. This is the battle. You leave this room and you go to your family, to your work, to the gym, to a restaurant, to the gas station. That's your battlefield. It's it. You got me on that one, man. Finding that love when I found that love when I finally humbled myself Because I thought I could do it all on my own because the world tells me Eddie you're a tier one operator the highest level You're killing bads due by the dozens, which is a great thing because bad people suck. I Was I was enough and I needed that love I needed that love but with that love came a, comes a warrior and That's what dad wants he wants us to fight for the kingdom and save souls we are supposed to be doing hostage rescues, stealing the souls back from the evil one and give it to the kingdom. That's our mission. Great question. All right, let me close in prayer and then I have a little bit of an announcement. Father God, we, um, we honor you and... Um, our hearts are so desperate for you. Would you continue to pour by the power of the Holy Spirit into this room, into the hearts of every man in this room? We need you. We're desperate for you. 
We have a sense of anticipation of what you're going to do in the remaining time we have in this time we've called together under the conditions of, well, not the most convenient conditions. Father, we love you. We pray mercy. We thank you for the sacrifice at the cross. And uh, would you bless each and every man by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so here's what we're going to do. What happened? Um, we're going to take about 30 minutes. And um, before I say that, let me say this. At the end today at 3 o'clock, we're going to spend an hour where we're going to pray on you. We're going to lay hands on you if you want. We're either going to do it in here or in the World Center. But um, just know a lot of you need prayer. A lot of you need your hands on. We're going to do that too. For now, we're going to take 30 minutes, go to the World Center. There's food. Eddie's got his books. Pastor Mike's got his, his good meat rub stuff. There's other sponsors, honor them. Dean's Good Life Table is there. Man Camp, Man Camp is the end of March. We've lowered the price for you. We take men up to the mountains for a Friday afternoon, Sunday, Saturday, and then Sunday morning. Um, and I guess that's it for the announcements. Be back here, we're gonna do a little worship. And then we're going to have Stephen, Eddie, and Daryl should be there by then. And then we're going to close in prayer. We love you guys. We appreciate you. We'll be back. Amen. He has um, Instagram, a website presence called Fifth Horseman. Also the Fourth Watch. And uh, man, you're going to be blessed. Stephen, come on up, brother. All right, if everyone could please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Hot mic. I think they're going to queue it any second now. I want you to all understand something. A life of warfare is a life of worship. If there's anyone in here that struggles to worship God, worship Jesus, to call on the Holy Spirit, spirit of rebellion, spirit of pride, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, all these things could be stopping you from actually dwelling and abiding in God through worship. That is how we commune. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Those verses ready? Okay. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So I'm gonna give you a caveat. I don't think this first one has ever been read out loud inside of a church by anyone, let alone a group of men. Deuteronomy 23.1, he who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. If a man doesn't have a set of balls, God doesn't want him in his house. I'm not going to get into the full reading of Revelation, but I, I need you to see it, if you see it. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderous, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Heavenly Father, we love you. Holy Spirit, have your presence in this place. Help me get out of the way and help you step forward. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can see. I'm, uh, I'm like the, the worst kind of Christian. I'm the worst of all of you in the room, actually. My horns have held up my halo pretty much my whole life. Um, I did very well in business for a long time. My father was a pastor, mom was a cop. And I, I grew up around a bunch of megachurch pastors. I saw the business end of church. I want nothing to do with it. I, I thought it was all a bunch of BS. I usually give the caveat, right? I love Jesus, but I, I drink scotch, I cuss, and I still tell gay jokes. So listen, it, it is what it is. I'm trying to hold all those things in check right now. But I say that because the same me that you get on the stage will be the same me that you see behind the scenes, the same me that you see when I'm leading men to prayer. And a lot of people think like, oh, if he cusses, 
why is he praying in tongues? If he cusses, why is he healing people? If he cusses, why is he laying hands to cast out devils? There's a spirit of religion in this country that is stifling a move of God that's trying to take hold and set fire to this place. The spirit of religion is inside every single house that will not get out of the way and will not spend more time ushering in the Holy Spirit. And this is why I need to first read it and then at the end, I need every single man in this room to stand up and say these words and mean it. The God-fearing man's declaration for the situation in you know, the world that we're in right now. I am the church. I will engage the church. And I will become the church. And so much of the church narrative right now. And listen, I, I, I think every single one of us inside this room has to be connected to a church. You might have to go to a few of them before you find yourself settling inside one of them. But what the church is never going to tell you to do is to be the church. The four-wall church right now is too busy maintaining a business. What are the metrics of success for a business? People and money. Churches are focused on that because people want that same condition. As long as they can go to church, get dressed up, the kids get a little bit of word, they go eat afterwards, they move on to the next. We've allowed the cultural condition to become a spiritual condition of the church. Because right now we're in very dangerous territory. I hope to God every single man in this room is a Christ follower. What did Christ say? You'll know my followers. They will pray in tongues, cast out devils, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, drink poison and not die. We have mega churches here saying, don't rebuke the devil, don't rebuke anything, right? Only the Lord rebukes. And then says, oh, actually we don't do that anymore. When you die, good luck telling God that. As we keep going forward and keep tripping over ourselves, wondering why is the world falling apart? It's because we're not there. Why does the church have no power? It's because we're not there. Why does the church have no balls? Because we don't have balls and we're not there. If we're so worried about tripping over someone's gender identity, and by the way, the last time the Bible refers to someone as having a they, them, the demoniac of Gadara, 2,000 demons inside that person, Jesus cast them out. And society is telling us what? Accept it. Not just accept it, you should have yours too. There's a condition within the community that is uh, it's poison. And the longer that we go without a response, it's absolutely going to be hand, you know, handed to us to clean it up. C.S. Lewis, 1939, in case any of you haven't actually spent time with the screw tape letters, says our plan is very simple. To creates so much noise in the world that man can no longer hear the voice of God. To create so much noise in the world, to distract, deceive, to where you can't even hear God's voice anymore. I'd say that plan is working. I'm up here because I'm a, I'm a man of no rank, no renown. I have avoided the front row like the plague after growing up the way that I did with my, my father. He was the music minister for TBN for seven years. And so trust me when I say I, I saw just about everything. The moment those cameras were turned off, we saw very different personalities. Praise God for the church because it brought us here. Praise God for the church because we are all recipients of the message, the, you know, what the church has done, what Dream Center has done. Praise God for that. But the reason why I need each man in this room to make those three standing declarations. I am the church is a declaration that's outside your pay grade. How can you be the church? The church says that you're a sinner needing saved. The church says that you are less than and you need to be within the corporate body. Yes, that's true. The church is saying all sorts of things because it needs you to keep going to church. So that why, that's why it's the second part. You will engage the church. You will remind the pastor that he is also a man. The word of God tells us that the pastors are supposed to raise teachers and disciples. What's a disciple? Someone that is taught to the level to be sent. Most churchgoers are taught to just fill a chair and fill the offering bucket as it goes around. That's why I need every single person in this room to understand where they are at spiritually. And this is why. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to give you a little background. To understand where I'm coming from, I need you to understand a, a high level of where I'm at spiritually. Jesus is Lord. 
I have a biblical worldview that's immovable, unshakable. I take the Bible literally, not as allegory, not as fantasy, not as incomplete. I refer to Jesus as Lord, Savior, and friend. But I'm in a season in my life, and it happened for quite some time, where I refer to him as commander. If you understand chain of command and how this works, we're given orders, the word of God. This isn't just optional. It's not like this is just a bunch of data for, for us to input and process. This is directive. This is instruction, and we don't treat it like that. I believe that every Christ follower should be baptized in water in the Holy Spirit, and I urge each and every single one of you to do the very, at the very least, desire to be filled with spiritual gifts, regardless of what your pastor may or may not say about it. If you have the gall to call yourself a Christ follower, I expect you to desire and operate within those gifts. Otherwise, I look at you like you're smacking away the hand of Christ himself. I have no filter, spiritually or otherwise. My mental image of Jesus is a risen, glorified, conquering king. A king that we are not worthy of his return, not yet. I believe that the events of 2020 showed the world the church age has ended and the kingdom age has begun. I'm having a difficult time seeing most of the four walled churches in the country as much more than kid nurseries that are stunting people's spiritual growth and are holding back everything that God wants to pour out. And now I also need to give you an idea of prayer and what this means for me. I've been doing intercessory prayer from the hours of three to six o'clock in the morning for a greater part of 10 to 15 years, off and on in the beginning and pretty steadfast over the last several. It's not for everyone. I believe that I keep getting woken up at three o'clock in the morning because God is searching to and fro through the body of Christ to find someone that will actually get up, shake off the comfort, shake off the dust, come out of your, your sleep and your lethargy and step forward and take action. I don't find too many other people walking and praying from three to six o'clock in the morning. Most people just turn over and go back to bed. I believe that each and every single one of us are vessels for the Holy Spirit. I think that we're supposed to be infilled. I think that we have gas tanks of hatred and love that first starts with our love. And this is why six things the Lord hates, yet seven are abomination to him. How many can recite those in this room? Show of hands. Okay, handful. How many times have people heard from church, God is love? Okay, God is Lord. Okay, you know what the ratio is? The Bible says God is love four times in the Bible. It says God is Lord over 400. What's the emphasis been on? Soft baby, infant, Ricky Bobby, Jesus. You have to lift your eyes, elevate your eyes, elevate your conversation, elevate your fight. The other part of this is, is interesting because as I keep going forward, you know, we're reminded of stories like Gideon. And as it relates to spiritual warfare, this is why I bring up the two gas tanks. I'm a massive vessel for the Holy Spirit to fill in with God's love or his hatred at any given moment. I love God so much. I love him more than myself and I love him more than people. Culture, even Christian culture, loves and tries to show love to people more than even trying to show love to God. They don't realize that the love that they're showing to people who are drenched in their sin without any remorse whatsoever is treason against God. How many people in here know someone that's angry at God? It says, why hasn't God done something about the pedophiles? Why hasn't God done this? Why hasn't God done that? Did you know that the word of God is him asking you right back the exact same questions? You know, the Deuteronomy 24, 7 says that you're supposed to take men out of the village and take them out, those that have kidnapped people, done things to them. Why? Because God understands trauma. So many people think we just were a New Testament church. No, there, there is no Old and New Testament. It's one Bible. You have to remove that middle divider from your, from your studying, from your church. If your pastor is focusing too much time on the New Testament and the narrative isn't getting across of how brutal God is in that sense, you need to come out of her. You yourself need to take your faith at such a visceral level that you will not let God go until he shows you his full and complete word that he has in store for you. Job it talks about it. Job 3 talks about Job's fears have come forward. That's which he feared the most has come to pass. And then as you continue to read Job, what does God say? Prepare yourself like a man. I have questions and you will answer me. 
That's God saying that. Not like, oh no, I love you so much. It's going to be fine. You're going to be great. And then what if we be allowed to creep in? There's so much talk right now about the tribulation and about getting out with a, with a hall pass. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Okay, so if the Bible talks to a bunch of people in the Word of God about what's going to come and what you're going to see, how does that give us an idea that we're getting out without any skin in the game? How does a pre-trib rapture even factor in? The Bible is speaking to God's people who will still be on this earth and will usher in the millennial reign of Christ. Once you know that God's word says that, who wants a hall pass out? Anyone? People here just want to tap out? So God rises and conquers the grave to fill you with his Holy Spirit, and you just want to hall pass out. You say, no, I don't want trouble. I just want safety and security and comfort. The comfort's going to kill you. My goal is to have the stage set for you to hear the next two speakers and open yourselves up because there's a spiritual contagion that's taken hold of this country, has a lot of different names, but it ultimately comes down to something that's antichrist. When you have the institutions of the world that are trying to remove the Bible, right? Who's God's chosen respondent? What institution? It has a name and it's called the church and it's not the four wall church that can't agree to anything. It's God's men on fire with the Holy Spirit thriving within them on the offensive. And I'm not trying to give you talking points to follow me. I'm trying to give you talking points that you can take this and run with it, that you become exactly what God intended you to be. And what's happening is the fact that you keep thinking you just need to go to church and go to church. Guess what? Your pastor's the teacher one day a week. How are you going to lead your family? Are you going to FaceTime him every day? Listen, as this world falls apart, the Bible is coming true. You can argue all day long. You don't agree. That's fine. But the reality is if this word doesn't come true, he's not God. Think about that. If we don't see the tribulation and see the patterns ultimately culminate, culminate in musical chairs and everything comes true, he's not God. We're running out of runway of saying that all these prophecies are BS. At a certain point, we have to reconcile ourselves, have a face-to-face -face with God and say like, okay, you brought me here for a reason. I'm seeing all these things happen. My family's looking at me like, why don't you do something about it? I'm looking at society like leaders, why don't you do something about it? What's God saying? Like, do something about it. And this is why it's, it's important to understand an aspect of spiritual warfare, which it's funny. So I love the fact that Eddie's going to go there because that's usually my wheelhouse. And today God's like, don't go there, but just do a quick, a quick little flyby. Judges 8 verse 9. This is Gideon that went to the leaders of Succoth, the city that was at war. And Gideon was a judge. Gideon was doing the business. And he basically went to them for food for his men, for his 300. They refused. They said, well, actually, we still have these two princes that are a problem. We need to go do something about that. What's Gideon's response? Everyone talks about what he did with the 300. And, oh, look, 30,000 men down to, you know, 1%. There's a biblical narrative that tells us that only a small percentage of God-fearing believers will take action. 1%. So in Judges 8, 9, Gideon says, I will come back in peace and destroy. What does the word God talk about that? Where else, do, where else do we hear about peace in the New Testament that everyone loves to say, talk about? John 14, 27, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, but I do not give it to you as the world gives you peace. Jesus' says, other words, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. If I'm trying to impress upon you the fact that the Bible is teaching you a version of Jesus that is not the full and complete version of Jesus in the Bible, you need to come out of her. You need to come out of her. You are the church, you will engage the church, and you will become the church. The four-wall church is not likely to become the church worthy of a king's return. The four-wall church is not likely to tell you you need to be set on fire and lead your family and go on the offensive. The four-wall church is in self-preservation mode. Wondering what's coming next. I praise God for pastors that are speaking up. I pray for them all the time. But I've got, we've got pastors on the main stage across the country that are speaking up and are not pressing in spiritually. 
What are they doing? They're still speaking to a human response to a spiritual condition. That's not spiritual warfare. That's human warfare. We're going to war through people. We're going to war through leaders. We're going to elect people. And hopefully they're going to make change. Nope. God's saying, nope. I need you individually as my follower to effectuate change. Stop looking to someone else. I'm a, I'm a little bit torn too because this is where I'm not a violent person. If you actually knew me as a kid, I was this fat, happy-go-lucky kid. I just wanted to like watch G.I. Joe cartoons and like eat everything. And so people that find me now, they're like, oh my gosh, that guy's intense. Oh my gosh, he's got anger problems. I'm like, kind of, but as we become vessels for the Holy Spirit to indwell in us, what happens? Who's got a gas tank of love for others? Love others. We love others. Praise Jesus. We're here. Do you love people enough to warn them about their sin? Do you just, oh, oh, I've gone too far. Holy, I felt a nudge to say something. I just didn't say it. I, sh I shouldn't say that. Does God need you to be polite or holy? Does God need you to be perfect or in the process of sanctification? How many people don't say anything because they think, oh, I can't say anything. I haven't dealt with my own business yet. Come out of her. That's a mindset of a dead church. Come out of her. The Bible even goes as far as to give us math, percentages, as to how we're supposed to look at the body of Christ. Matthew 25 talks about 10 virgins, five with oil and five without. 50% of the body of Christ will not have the faith sufficient to enter heaven by the time Christ returns. That's in the Bible. That's not math according to Steve. Then what? Revelations 2 and 3, the seven churches. That means each church, roughly 15%. That means only 15% of the churches are the Philadelphia church doing what God wants them to do. 15% are the Laodicean church working for the other team, and the other churches in the middle are doing nothing. Come out of her. The Bible is trying to speak to your current state and your future state, always speaking to your potential exactly at whatever page that you turn to. I'm not saying that every church is in the way. I'm saying that you're the one that's allowing church to be in the way of you becoming Christ church. It's up to you. It's on you. And the more that you read and the more you go through, this is how gangster God gets. 1 Samuel 26. It's the story of David. David snuck into the camp of Saul, and Abner was the commander of Saul's army. And this is also a model for prayer, right? When we pray, we pray the word of God to God, and his word doesn't return void to him. What does David say to Saul? God, kill him. May he come to die, or may he enter the battle and be taken. That's a prayer that every single man in this room, every woman watching online, every child watching online, can say immediately to God and say, look at all the political leaders. God, kill them. May they come to die. Or may they enter battle and fall, and then follow up with the subsequent verse towards the end of the chapter. God judge every single man according to their righteousness or faithfulness. You have this, this heavy weight feeling like the government's doing nothing. It's treasonous. It's seditious. It's working against us. It's trying to vilify, control us, ultimately to our own demise. Pray the words. What's going to happen? God either changes the condition or he changes you. Who wants both? Anyone? That's it? That's it? Okay, so there's, there's a condition of that. God's speaking through David. He's speaking straight at Abner. And this is something I feel that the Holy Spirit's been speaking to every single one of us, and he's going to continue speaking it to you until you get the big picture. Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your Lord the King, for one of the people came to destroy your Lord the King? Why have you failed to guard the Lord's anointed? Are you not a man, and who is like you? Are you not a man according to the word of God? Do you have a set of balls? Are you a coward that's not going to enter heaven? Is he not calling you forward? Who is like you that's alive right now, that's seen the Bible come to life like never before? Are you not a man, and who is like you? And you fail to protect the Lord's, everything that he's given to us. Kids, why isn't every man going to every single school board meeting? Emptying their homes, emptying their apartments, even if you don't have kids. The devil's got your balls. You go to church, you haven't become the church. 
you think you can keep going to church and keep making these things happen. And God's like, uh, are you not a man? And who is like you? And why have you failed to protect those things which I've trusted with you? That verse is never going to go away. Isaiah 52 talks about coming out of her. Revelation 18 also says this. Everyone has their own theories about what is and what isn't Babylon. I've got my own. I need every single man in this room to press into the, to the Bible, read, study, press into the Holy Spirit with prayer, ask those questions. But I need to read you this passage. Revelation 18, after these things I saw another angel coming down from the heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons. Anyone see demonically afflicted people around us? A prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through an abundance of her luxury. If that doesn't explain who America is and how we've influenced the rest of the world, you are spiritually, mentally, emotionally blind to degrees. This isn't for you. This message isn't for you at all. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And this is the kicker. G.K. Beale wrote a commentary in Revelation and refers to this next verse as having three possibilities. The voice from heaven is speaking to God's human agents of retribution, God's angelic agents of retribution, or the angel is speaking right back to God. And this is what it says. Render to her just as she rendered to you. And repay her double according to her works. You know, the media is telling you that all these nations are preparing for war. The Chinese entire industrial complex has switched its manufacturing to weapons of war. We have troops to the north. We've got people coming into the borders, right? And our nation's doing nothing. The leaders are doing nothing. If you think this aspect of violence and what's going to happen to Babylon isn't going to come to your doorstep, you're lying to yourself. Then what are you going to do? Your wife's going to look at you and say, do something. You didn't pray. Your kid's going to say, keep us safe. You can't. Who wants to do the work now in prayer and then get ready in person? Anyone? Anyone? Who wants to be chosen as God's human agents of retribution back on those evil ones that are destroying everything that the Lord loves? That's on us. And what's the first instruction? By the way, just, just for clarity, Babylon falls first before God says, come out of her. What if God allows this place to come down in order for it to be resurrected back? And this is what kills me about the two sides, what I feel like are God's heart carried out in, in the American citizen. The patriotic American wants justice. They want Trump. They want an idol to take their place so that they can go back to get business as usual, right? Everything goes back to normal. The Pentecostal, spirit-filled American wants God to come down and then just get a pass out. What if both sides of God's heart, the Old Testament heart with the patriotic American that's willing to get their hands dirty, and the New Testament heart God that's trying to just pray heaven down and get an escape, what if they're both supposed to come together and do the real work? What if we're the ones, both sides of God's heart, what if the value system is broken and the cultural value system is trying to tell us we're evil, we're villains, we're this, we're that, and God's like, are you not a man? And who is like you? See, there's a disconnect because we're not dead to self. We still want to esteem ourselves as capable, as, as aware, as somehow we're going we're gonna to do something. Even if you're going to pull a trigger, think about this. If God's not behind it, what spirit is? The spirit of murder, the spirit of pride. If you're a guy that's just stocking up on guns and ammunition and having no spiritual backbone or fiber within you whatsoever, Good luck. This is, this is that component of man, the, the sin nature, right? Our own evil within us thinking like, oh no, we've got this. We don't need God. Not the case. Or no, we've got this. We're just going to get an escape and a hall pass out of here. It's not the case. 
What if God's word is speaking to a condition, a multi-generational church of people that's willing to do the hard work internally, externally, raise kids and generations of people to do the hard work over and over and over again until our Christ returns? Come out of her. Are you not a man who is like you in all of Israel, and why have you failed to protect the Lord's anointed? The more that we go down this rabbit hole, you have to address something as it relates to the church identity that's given you. You're not a sinner. You are in the throes of sinning. Your identity is saved. The helmet of salvation, the process of sanctification. It's not a one and done. It's not the helmet of the saved. Like, oh, look at us. We just, we got saved. We're good. Nothing else. We're just going to go make money. We're just going to go raise kids and a family. We're going to live in our own little internal worldly bubble and just not really pay attention to Antifa and BLM and all this, you know, the transgender noise, and then really not pay attention to the spiritual condition outside of us. How awesome. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a father that thinks that you can somehow avoid the spiritual work, you're a coward. If you won't resolve yourself, your grievances, your agony, your pain, your trauma with Christ, you're a coward. If you think that you can lift your way out, you can make a physical posture that much stronger to withstand everything, guess what? Cancer comes. How do you fight that internally? What do you need? You need something spiritual. What about your, your law degree? What about your philosophy? What about your philosophical faith and your intellectual faith? You just think lofty Christian thoughts. That's going to save you? No. When people are coming to bang down your door, do you want an intellectual response or a spiritual response? You want angels raining down? That's spiritual. That's not mental. That's not emotional. It's not philosophical. Which means you have to become more spiritual. We serve a risen king in human form sitting up in heaven. And the world says, that's BS. Our response to the spirit, where we're ushering down a supernatural response to the human condition around us, and we're praying heaven down, that's spiritual warfare. Until I hope my heartiest of hearts that we get hybrids we get giants we get nephilim we get every foul demonic thing embodied in some sort of physical form that we get to take every form and manner of weapon even our bare hands and crush them to pieces but where does it start it starts in prayer can God trust you now to do the spiritual work where you're praying down in heaven saying, Satan, all your work will come to nothing. Your grip on my life will come to nothing. The vices you placed in front of me will come to nothing. And then you have guys, listen, I love me some Jordan Peterson. There's a bunch of great voices. I love Marcus Aurelius. What stands in the way becomes the way. There's a bunch of amazing earthly wisdom. And what's God say? I'm going to make foolish the wisdom of the wise. You're not going to think your way or feel your way into a spiritual revival. Your spirit has to bring in and usher in and receive revival. Revival has to start with you. Who's got people at home you might want to see saved? I'm pretty sure every single one of us, that's on, on the list. You think a mental, philosophical, emotional faith is going to save them? No. So what do you pray? Oh, I don't know. The fact that more men aren't at war for every single member of their family, every single member within the church that's held captive by a gospel that doesn't preach the gifts of the spirit and doesn't put people on the offensive, you're making three things. And pray for their faith, that their faith become a spiritual faith, that they have a spiritual experience and awareness. I'm going to pray for their, what? Forgiveness. Why does the Bible through Nehemiah 1 tell us that we're supposed to repent on behalf of our fathers and forefathers? Why does Job tell us to repent for our kids? And I get to give you the fun part. Numbers 32, verse 20. Then Moses said to them, if you do this thing, if you arm yourselves before the Lord for the war, and all your armed men cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from before him. Notice this. He's causing you to be sent. You're the one doing the work, carrying the swords and the weapons, and he gets the credit. Praise God. And the land is subdued before the Lord. Then afterwards, and only afterwards, you may return and he be blameless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. Here's the kicker. Before I say this, show of hands, who's ever started something and failed? 
I bet you haven't been told this recently by a pastor in church, but if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Every single man in here that started to do something for God and failed and fell short, that is sin. Every single time you get this soft start and don't follow through, it's sin. Are you not a man who is like you? Why have you failed to protect what God has given you? Have you repented for these things and wiped your slate clean? This starts and ends with repentance until the day that we're taken back to heaven. Every single day, every single moment, maybe hour by hour, maybe minute by minute. You hate the enemy. A man over here that we talked about that, right? You, you have to hate the thing that's coming to kill you. We don't hate it. We don't love what God loves and hate what he hates. We love what we love and hate what we hate. And then everyone's got this little, this little number of like, oh, maybe that's not that bad. I don't know. Maybe it's, that's not for me. That's for someone else. That's for like a Steve or like an like a Ed Penny. They're crazy. They're weird. They're too intense. The Bible gives us math and shows us 50% of the believers when Christ comes won't make it. The Bible gives us math and says that only one in seven churches is doing what God wants them to do. What do you want? You want kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? You want more time? Is that, is that the power of our God, our gospel? You just want to buy time? You just want to hope to God that we can last it? There isn't a single honorable man on the face of this earth that's embroiled in a war and hands the battle to his children. Even if you don't have kids, what does that mean for you? You're a coward. If you won't resolve your spirituality and dive off the deep end exactly as the Holy Spirit leads you, you're not a man. The devil's got your balls. This soft, tepid, timid Jesus doesn't exist. He's love. He is Lord. He's commander. You have to make up your mind as to what you call him. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, the whole, the whole point, the whole point as it comes, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. So are you. Okay, so who feels anger? Oh, come on. Come on. I see smiles. I see no, I see, yeah. Okay, maybe not you guys. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know you. Okay, when's the last time you gave it to God? When's the last time you asked him to weaponize it? When's the last time you said, praise God, I'm going to be angry and not sin? When's the last time you read Matthew 11:12? 12, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. When's the last time you thought about violent prayer? When's the last time you thought about giving the enemy his ass back to him through prayer? When's the last time you woke up and got uncomfortable in the moment that something strikes your heart and your spirit, you go on the offensive. In the name of Jesus, this will come to nothing. Or do you just turn over and go back to bed? Do you turn over and just keep the, keep the conversation as low as possible and just don't ruffle too many people and, don't, and don't, don't offend the pastor and the nice little lady saying, oh, he cusses and he dresses in black. He's not of God. Cool, I'm not of your God. Whatever God you think that is, I'm not of that God. I submit myself daily before God for every single thing that I do and repent all the time. I'm refined in his fire and I put myself there. And honestly, it's pretty uncomfortable until it's not. It sucks until it doesn't. It's hard until it's easy. What if Bible's saying, are you not a man and who is like you trying to call you forward saying, shake off the dust, come out of her and do the work. Prepare yourselves spiritually for what's at hand, not just physically, not just emotionally or philosophically. We're going to end up in a condition in this nation where the enemies come in because for, for a multitude of reasons. What are people going to say? Wait a second, the rapture didn't happen. Oops, did I get that wrong? Did I get my dates wrong? They're going to say there is no God because he's allowed his people to be attacked. And really what's going to happen is you're going to have a great falling away. But before that, in the name of Jesus, there's going to be a great rising up of every single heart and soul and spirit inside this room and elsewhere. You've got pastors that are crapping on Asbury Revival saying it doesn't have this or this or that. What are they showing you? The church is in the way. And I'm not trying to crap on the church. Kind of low-key, just saying. What always hit me too about like Nehemiah and Ezra, when you see that they're both written at the same time, and they're both covering the same thing. Xerxes gives Ezra this letter. I need to find it. It just hit me. 
Thank you, God. I was blown away when I read this because, uh, listen, I'm not looking, I'm not looking for these things. I'm not looking to see the church in a different way, but this is the word of God. The Holy Spirit inspired Xerxes to give Ezra a letter. And Ezra was a priest while Nehemiah was like, you know, building the walls with the men. And it gets, it gets to this part, all right? 24, also, this is, this is the king. Also, we will inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, or servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to your God, given wisdom, set magistrates and judges. Oh, look, the Bible tells us to set judges. That's weird. Who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river and all such as know the laws of your God. And teach those who do not know them. This is the part where it gets a little dark. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed specifically on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. And what do you think Ezra's response is? Not like, wow, that's crazy. Blessed is the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord. Fire. That's fire, but let's apply some, some current cultural commentary over that. Ezra focused on the money to beautify the four-walled church. Ezra didn't focus on you becoming the church. Does that remind you of any pastors these days? using language of warfare and taking territory, yet what are they saying? Give us money so we can expand. They want to expand the four wall. They want satellite locations and praise God for that. There's some churches on fire that absolutely deserve to expand and just thrive. But are they saying, praise God, because we're going to use all these resources and make disciples of men and send them? No. Come out of her. Are you not a man who is like you? God is saying these things to every single one of us right now. If you will step forward, if you will stand up for what God has to do, I'd like every man in this room that has a heart for it to stand up, and we're going to recite the same three things that I said in the very beginning. You're going to repeat after me, but this time, in the name of Jesus, I just pray repentance and forgiveness for every man in this place, that he have a clean, contrite heart, that everything that's spoken through his words are true. As you're led, I am the church. I will engage the church. I will become the church worthy of my king's return. Thank you, guys. I'm done. Listen, real quick, before we get up, I want this group, this body of Christ right here, anyone in this group that has a legitimate father wound, that has a grievance, that has, that has a, a bitterness that hasn't been resolved because an earthly father, a father figure, he did some damage. Maybe that's no one here. Maybe that's someone online watching. But I need to do something and just go through the exercise. And you guys are going to stand in the people's place that might see this video in the future. I need you to look at me as that figure. I need you to pour, go through the fast emotional process of pouring whatever it is that you're holding against someone else in that capacity and place it on me. I need you to just drum it up. Ask the Holy Spirit if there's something that you haven't let go of. If there's something that's still heavy, if there's a weight and a burden on you that you were never meant to carry, that someone did something or several things over time, whether it was abuse, neglect, abandonment, I need you to place it on me. I need you to dig it up, ask the Holy Spirit again if there's anything there for you online watching, for anyone else at home. Place it on me right now. This is something that has to be done because it has to be cleansed. If we're calling you sons of thunder, if God himself is saying to arise as his men, we need to resolve something. If everyone look at me now, imagine other people in your life that have the same father wound or some sort of grievance on them. I need you to place that on me as if you're able to place their burden on my shoulders right now.
I'm sorry and forgive me. Forgive me. I wasn't myself, but I was myself. Forgive me. I said things. I did things. I didn't do things. I didn't say things. I need you to forgive me. I need you to leave this here on me now. I need you to pick up your cross, but you can only do that if you leave this on me here now and accept my apology, an apology that might not be coming from another human being, except mine. This has to end. We have an entire culture of people that even if they have a father at home, there's no presence that is in their life that's keeping them from the grips and the throes of what's happening right now. As you go forward, as you're watching online, I need you to lift up other men. And if you experience other men that have burdens and grievances and pains, you need to do the exact same thing that I did and what follows. I want you all to receive a Father's blessing. I want you to all know that we have a Father in heaven that has made you, designed you in His image, fearfully and wonderfully made. And He intends to bless you and walk with you, but you have to come right with Him. That means all these wounds have to die on you because you let them die on Christ. This generation of men has to step forward. We're just examples. You have to be the example of the men in your life, of the military men in your life, of the other disconnected people, the family members in your life. You have to become that example. You have to become the man that alleviates generations of weight and guilt and blame and anger and lust and pride and yelling and violence. It has to die on you exactly like it did. I died on Christ. It ends here. Love you guys. Praise God.